struggle with and learning to patiently wait on him. As much as our desire is to glorify in his name, sometimes we struggle with the idea that we need to be patient and to wait on what he's doing and to see where he's at work to join him. You know, we're in our third week of a series that we've called Greater Lessons from the Lesser Known. And we've looked at, you know, the first week we looked at Gideon and how God used this unknown who, who himself said that he was the lesser, the least member of his tribe and the least tribe of Judah um, to restore Israel, to remove oppression. Um, last week we talked about Hagar and a very uh, young lady who God used tremendously about how and teaching us when things are bad and when things are falling apart, how we can trust God to be where with us. What we're doing is we're looking at these men and women in the Old Testament who really, unless you grew up in church every single weekend and you were always there for Sunday school, you probably never heard of some of these people. Or if you've heard about them, you've certainly not heard their full story. Some of them have very little that's actually said about them. In the Old Testament. But what's said about them is powerful. So what we're going to do is we've been looking at these men and women and the lessons from thousands of years ago that we can learn and apply to our lives all these years later. So today we're going to take a look at a lesson from a lesser known. And we're going to look at two people that I believe are two of the most that make two very powerful statements in the Old Testament. Two of the most powerful proclamations I think there is. Um, words that are uttered by the two lesser known people. People you may never even have heard of. One was a guy named Jonathan. And if you've never heard of Jonathan, you're in pretty good company. Jonathan was simply the son of Israel's first king. His dad had um violated god's law and um did some things that he wasn't supposed to and so he had lost the throne and so he had you know had the prophet come and proclaim a different king and so saul was who's the first king he's attempting to eradicate this guy that that the prophet has anointed and god has anointed as a new king and Jonathan was in the next in line after Saul. If Saul had died, he would have been the next king normally. But for whatever reason, he was that was taken away from him. And his dad had um, was trying to murder David. And so we've got John in the middle of it. Jonathan in the middle of this. And Jonathan's older than David. He's probably in his 30s or 40s. And... Um, so you've got Jonathan. Okay. He was a warrior. He had trained for battle. He was kind of in line for, you know, if if what had happened, what if his dad had been obedient, he would have been the next king. And the other powerful proclamation that we're going to look at is by Jonathan's armor bearer. This guy is so less known, they don't even give his name scripture doesn't tell us who he is in fact as far as i can tell it's the only sentence in scripture that jonathan's armor bearer ever says it's the only time he's ever mentioned and i believe that what they have to say can impact and possibly change our own lives thousands of years later we're going to look at these two today so to set the stage, I need to give you a little bit about what's happening around these proclamations, how these two statements came to be said. So what was happening is like this, and, and okay, and like was often the case, 
Israel was in trouble. Um, they were in conflict again. And this time, the conflict was with these people called the Philistines. Now, the Philistines, if you know anything about them, if you know some of the story, this happens after David kills Goliath. So, and Goliath was the um, big guy, the, the giant. And he was one of the generals of the Philistines. So, Philistines in some ways are kind of the arch enemy of Israel. They're always a thorn. They've always a thorn. They get to be a problem most of their lives. And and so they're they're here. Here's the Israelite army. And they're perched on one side of this big steep ravine. And the army had been beaten badly, and they were diminished down to about 600 men. And they had as little as two or three swords is all they had left. I mean, 600 guys and two or three swords. And if you're wondering how did that happen, I can encourage you to read the entire account for yourself. The whole incident takes place. You can start reading in 1 Samuel around chapter 12 or 13. And read through chapter 14, and you'll see the entire context. Now, kind of what I'm giving you this morning to get to our our primary text is to is to give you kind of the cliff notes version because I want you to understand the background. When you go in, you know, like when you go to a movie, it says these events are based on a true story. Well, this is a true story. And what I'm telling you, I'm just, I'm laying some things out for you, okay? But, so the army's diminished, and they're demoralized, and they're sitting on one side of this ravine. Steep, and across steep, on the other side, on the other side is the Philistine army. They're powerful, they're ferocious, they're confident, they're well-trained, they're well-armed. Every man has a sword. And there's a battle coming, and they don't know for sure when it's going to happen, but there's a battle coming. Maybe both sides are sort of hoping the other one would start it, but everyone knew sooner or later something was going to happen. So Jonathan's hanging out with his armor bearer. The, the cool thing about being royalty in, in those days was you got an armor bearer. Now what that armor bearer did was you were somebody you were going to battle with, to fight with you, to look out for you. And, and he's with the armor bearer, and he's sitting there, and Jonathan makes a statement. He says, you know what? Let's go over there. Let's go over there and see what happens. Let's just go show ourselves to the Philistines. Let's go check it out. And so the armor bearer says, well, yeah, sure. Let's go. Let's do this. I'm in. Here's the interesting thing. His armor bearer had no choice. That was his job. That's what he got paid to do. So that, you know, he, he was young. He was a servant. And he was paid to follow Jonathan around. That was his job. So they go, and what's really cool is they climb up the rocky ravine and show themselves to the Philistines, and the Philistines say, come on up, we'll fight you. And scripture says the two young soldiers, Jonathan and his armor bearer, they defeat 20 Philistine warriors in hand-to-hand -hand combat. A powerful, powerful moment. Now, I don't know about you, if I'm Jonathan, I'm doing the, you know, after this is done, I'm probably doing the touchdown celebration dance, right? And I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that kind of stuff. Which, by the way, is, you know, okay. But that's a whole other side of the story. So they celebrate, I would imagine. And you could think that's got to be the end of the story. This guy's got wiped out, wiped out 20. Scripture says that God sends a spirit of fear and chaos to the entire Philistine army. And the Philistine warriors begin to turn against each other. And hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of them fight each other. They kill one another. And in essence, Jonathan and his armor bearer sit back and watch it all happen. Watch God deliver a victory out of utter defeat. And when you study scripture, you understand that he wanted to give that to the Israelites all along. I'm not sure if Jonathan and his armor bearer really knew that. And they might have had a hunch, but they got to sit back and watch it. Incredible moment. An awesome time when God showed up powerfully in the lives of two men who believed in him. But I want to take a look at this. The moment in time would never happen 
had they not said two powerful things, if they had not decided to obey God. If it wasn't for a statement that Jonathan made, followed by a statement by his armor bearer, the moment might not have taken place. And I want to share these two powerful statements, and, and I hope you'll see a side that we get to know, that we need to know. Okay. There's two powerful proclamations. The first is, perhaps God. Now, I'm not sure there's a more powerful statement that we can make than perhaps God. When I read scripture, I'm not sure there's a more powerful statement in scripture than when Jonathan says, perhaps God. Let me read the actual phrase, what he actually says in 1 Samuel 14, 6. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come, let us go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised men. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let us go over the outpost of these uncircumcised men. Perhaps God will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us, whether by many or by few. Now, Jonathan may have been one of those, you know, naturally, perhaps God, perhaps God will save us, perhaps God will intervene, perhaps God will break into history here. It may be that that's just how he was wired. He saw an obstacle Maybe God will act on our behalf. Maybe God wants to do something in this moment. Some of you today, you hear that and it resonates with you. Some of you are kind of naturally inclined to be a perhaps God thinker. I, it's how you're wired. It's how God shaped you. Some of you see an opportunity in work and your first connection is perhaps God wants me to jump in on this project. Some of you, you're at school and somebody's being mistreated and you just have this natural Perhaps God wants me to step up for this person. Some of you, you have a relationship challenge, and your first declamation is perhaps God will act on our behalf. Maybe God wants to fix this. It's just how you're naturally wired, like Jonathan was. We are beneficiaries of a perhaps God mindset. In my country, our founding fathers said, perhaps God will act for us if we rebel against England. Perhaps God will step in. The, the gentleman who started the prayer revival in 1857 in New York City Perhaps God will act if we began to seek his face. Jonathan Edwards, in that small church in New England, begging for God to give him New England. Perhaps God will act if I faithfully continue to proclaim his word. Perhaps God will give us second life, will give us the millions who participate in this virtual reality. If we are faithful to serve him here. Perhaps God redeem our nation again we'll return it back to the roots that it was founded on oh I know my God can but if we are faithful if we continue to seek his face continue to stand for our faith perhaps God will bring a great spiritual awakening one more time. History has been made by perhaps God people. People who said, you know what? I trust God to step in. And I know he can. 
So I'm going to step out in faith to see what he does. Maybe he won't answer my prayer the way I think he does. Maybe it will lead to me going home. But perhaps God wants to do something in that moment, and he's waiting for me to step out in faith. I keep thinking of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were before the king, and he's, he's demanded that they fall down and worship this 500-foot statue. And they look at him and they say, King, may you live forever. Our God is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, King, we will be faithful to him. Even if you throw us in the furnace, even if God doesn't intervene this time, we will remain faithful to our to our God. Folks, that's a huge amount of faith to say, even if it destroys us, even if we fall in this, we will still serve him. And of course, you know the story, they got thrown in the fiery furnace. They had lit it, they had, the king was so mad that he had it heated up seven times hotter than normal. And when they opened the doors to throw him in, several of the guards died from the flames leaping out. And the king looks up and he says, didn't we just throw three men in there? Well, yes, king, just three. Well, there's why is there a fourth one in there? And they're all walking around and none of them are singed. Call them out. Perhaps God can, will save our nation if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Then I will hear from heaven. That is the only hope our nations have, as if God intervenes. It's happened before. In the 1700s, a young man named Jonathan Edwards began to pray for New England, to pray for salvation. The newspapers at the time said that God was dead, and that Christianity would be gone within 10 years. Jonathan Edwards begged God and prayed with Prayed for, prayed for God to intervene. Finally, one Sunday morning, he got up, and Jonathan Edwards wasn't a dynamic speaker. He didn't have a lot of emotional impact. In fact, he was a little nearsighted. And so he wrote out his sermon in manuscript, and he read it to his congregation. Six inches before his face, Holding his transcript, he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. God so gripped that tiny congregation that men and women were actually clinging to the post because they felt as if they were falling into hell. They were so convicted of their sins and so altered that New England exploded and a great revival swept not just New England but all of the colonial United States so moved were they that men and women came to be Christians because of that revival. That revival who touched lives of people like George Washington, Patrick Henry, Alexander Hamilton, 
the signers of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Perhaps God will act. The thing is, there's another powerful proclamation right on Jonathan's heels. And it's made by an unknown kid who was an armor bearer. All he was doing was carrying Jonathan's armor and supporting him. Sort of like a caddy at a golf game. He had the extra swords and the shield. And if, 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 if Jonathan needed help, he would step in. And what he said was, I am with you, heart and soul. Now, what's amazing about the armor bearer is that he had to say, I am with you. Let's roll. You know, Jonathan says, perhaps God will act on our behalf. And his armor bearer says, do all that you have in mind. His armor bearer said, go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Okay. The armor bearer had to be with Jonathan. He didn't have a choice. That was his job. This was his assignment. He was obligated to say, Jonathan, I'm with you. Do what you need to do. I'll be there. He had to. They didn't have human relations departments back then. He couldn't say, well, Jonathan, you know that. You know what? I think I'm, I'm going to take a comp day. Um, I'm going to take a mental health day. Um, he couldn't do that. He had to say, I'm with you. What he didn't have to say was that second part. And that's the powerful part. He didn't have to say, well, Jonathan, I'm with you, heart and soul. I am totally surrendered. I am totally committed. I am totally devoted. He didn't have to say that part. Put yourself in Jonathan's shoes. Here's a perhaps God thinker. A young man with a vision, an idea, and the moment. Maybe God wants us to do something. He turns to his armor bearer, and his armor bearer, out of no obligation, not out of fear of getting in trouble if he didn't, but when his armor bearer says to him, Jonathan, I am with you, heart and soul. How much extra confidence that gave Jonathan to know that he was following where God was leading. Those words, I am with you, heart and soul, they're life-breathing, life-giving words when they're said. Some of you, you hear, I am with your heart and soul, and you resonate with that. You resonate with the armor bearer. You're a heart and soul type of person. And when you see something going on, you see a struggle, your first thought is, I empathize with those people. I'm with them. How can I support them? You know, when the people have been coming to me over the last couple of weeks talking about what's going on in their jobs and their homes and and everything going on and the attack they're suffering because of their faith. I desperately so want to be able to help them. To say, look, I know God loves you. I know God is with you in all of this. I wish I could be. Because they need to know that they have brothers and sisters in Christ who are there for them. Who are there praying for them. Who are there with them if possible. Because in the midst of their struggles, they are not alone. God is with them. Oh, I know, Bill. Sometimes all we can do is pray. Pray is a powerful tool. In fact, it's usually where we should start. Perhaps God will act. And I will follow you. I will be there, heart and soul. Perhaps God is a powerful statement to be backed up by a heart and soul statement. 
I'm not sure there are two more powerful combinations in Scripture. I'm not sure. I'm heart and soul. I am committed to what God has called me to do. I will take everything I have to do it. So which are you? In fact, if I gave you a spot to write in your note, in your handout, I want you to take a second and think about yourself. Which one do you bend toward? Do you identify with Jonathan, the perhaps God has called me to this? Probably sometimes you're, you identify with the armor bearer, heart and soul. That doesn't mean you're always going to identify with Paul, with Jonathan, and you're not always going to identify with the armor bearer. It kind of depends on the circumstances. There are some of you who normally God says, God leads you somewhere and you're, you're, God, I'm with you, heart and soul. I am willing to sacrifice. I am willing to submit. I am willing to be committed to what you called me to. And some of you say, well, perhaps God will intervene. You see somebody hurting. You see somebody in need. And you're thinking, I can intervene. I can be where God called me to be. I can step out in faith. Perhaps God has a plan for us. Perhaps God has said, you know what? Grace Baptist Church of Second Life. I called you here for a reason. I have great plans for you. God may be ready to use us. Perhaps God will intervene. Perhaps God has a great mission for us. And it is time to say to him, I'm with you, heart and soul. Now there's a couple things you need to listen to this and, and, and you need to learn this. Okay, Is that you want to lean into it, but you don't want to lock into it tightly. If you're a natural, perhaps, God thinker, don't apologize for that. Lean into it. Go with that. That's how God wired you. Don't apologize for being a heart and soul kind of person either. Lean into it. Okay. Perhaps, God, people, you might come to the time where you need to be the heart and soul. Maybe God's called you and you're saying, God, I am committed. I am following you all with all I am. Not just intellectually. Not just mentally. I am following you with all of me, my heart and my soul, and I am sold out and I am surrendered. Heart and soul, people, there could come a time when you feel a nudge and maybe you haven't felt it in a while and you're going, perhaps God wants me to go with that. Maybe God wants me to step out in faith. It's scary. It's outside my comfort zone, but that's okay. Learn to go with that. Learn to lean into it, but not lock into one side or the other. Sometimes you need to learn to look and listen. Look for opportunities to do what comes naturally. And look for opportunities to practice doing what maybe God has called you to do. I think Jonathan was looking for an opportunity to be a perhaps God guy. I think he was looking for a chance to say, maybe God wants us to do this. He was paying attention. He was looking for it. So look for opportunities to practice. Someday, you might get that opportunity to say, 
Perhaps God wants me to step in here. Perhaps God wants me to stand in the gap here. Perhaps God has a ministry for me here. And it's out of my comfort zone. And I don't know what I'm doing. But that's okay. Perhaps God wants to step in here. Many, many years ago. When God called me to the ministry. That was a step of faith for me. Sitting in that Sunday school class, discussing our spiritual gift survey. And that still, quiet, small voice in the back of my mind went, Ministry. You need to be in ministry. And I remember thinking, I'm losing it. There's no way God could use me. God had to convince me that that's what he was calling me to. I finally, after lots of debate, after lots of argument with God, I said, fine, God. I don't really believe this is you calling me. But I'm going to ask one of my mentors. And so I made an appointment with the associate pastor, music leader, and had been my youth pastor for years. And I walked into his office and I sat down at his desk, all ready to pour all this out and hear him say, oh, you know, well, you're right. God really didn't call you. You're just, you know, I, that's what I figured was coming. And I sat down to start to explain what was going on. And he said, Mike, I need to talk to you about something before you say anything. And he says, God has laid it on my heart. He's called you. Perhaps God wants me in this place, in this time, for his great work. Because he certainly worked out the details. Not me. And as you're looking, listen to wise counsel. Listen to God's still small voice nudging you forward, pulling you back. Step, wait, push, hold on, look, but listen. Jonathan did that. Jonathan didn't just go in full of steam, not thinking about it. Jonathan, even though he was perhaps a God person, he gave God a chance. He listened to God in case God had a different plan. And you can read that right there in 1 Samuel 14, verses 8 through 10. This is after he says, perhaps God, his armor bearer says, let's do this. And then Jonathan says, okay, let's do this. But Jonathan said, come on, then we will cross over toward them and let them see us. If they say to us, wait there, we will come down to you. We will stay where we are and not go up. But if they say, come on up to us, we will climb up. And because that will be our sign, the Lord has given them into our hands. Did you see that, folks? He's sitting here in faith knowing that God is calling him over there. And he's willing to be patient and see God's plan in this. So Jonathan is perhaps a God guy. And he's giving God space to intervene. He's giving God time to say, hey, Jonathan, you've got a good idea there. But I have a better one. It's not my idea. Jonathan, hold back. Not right now. Look and listen. Finally, a third thought is this. Learn from others. Life's best lesson was usually learned from what other people teach us. We learn all kinds of stuff from other people. We can start, we start by looking at scripture. And the Bible is full of other, perhaps, God and heart and soul men and women. And I could give you um, lots of examples. You can read those examples I gave you. Jonathan was perhaps God, but Jonathan was also heart and soul. 
And if you read his whole story, you'll find out there's a moment in Jonathan's relationship with David. Hey, it's an amazing friendship. And the biggest reason it's such an amazing friendship is because Jonathan's in that relationship to David was a heart and soul friend. In fact, there's a moment in their friendship where Jonathan says to David almost the exact same thing his armor bearer says to him. Do what you need to do, David. I am with you. Learn from that. Read the scriptures. The Old Testament is full of wonderful lessons of perhaps God thinking and heart and soul thinking. Learn from each other. Perhaps God wants to demonstrate to the Israel people that he is still God. And he's the only true God, Elijah says. And he ends up on the mountain with all these prophets of Baal. And he says, you go first and whoever can call and get their God to send fire down from heaven is the one true God. And so the Baal prophets, they, they did all this elaborate dancing and they, they, they begged and pled and, and, and Elijah said over there and made fun of them. And finally, Elijah said, pour water over the sacrifice. Soak it. And so they did. And he said in a still small voice, God, you're able. God, perhaps you will intervene here. And I am with you, God, heart and soul. And fire consumed not just the sacrifice, but evaporated all the water. That was in the, the pit around the sacrifice. And it was a great victory, but it was also a demonstration that God was willing to intervene. The Old Testament is full of such lessons that say, perhaps God will act on our behalf. Perhaps God is willing to step in. In the 1857 prayer revival in New York City, a young man started a prayer meeting. That's all he did. He began to pray and beg God to intervene in the world around him. There was so much anger and so much hatred and so much need of Jesus Christ. That's all he did. And he went. And he convinced him to let him start a Wednesday afternoon prayer meeting. That's all it was. And originally it was once a week. And they met in a little room. There was only like four or five of them to begin with. To pray for the city. To pray for salvation for the men and women who lived there. The prayer meeting took off. And God blessed it. And eventually, churches were opening their doors on a daily basis, every afternoon, for prayer. Just to pray. There was no preaching. There was no evangelist sitting on the corner screaming at people. Just prayer. A powerful God descended upon that city. And shook it to its very core. So much so that ships entering the harbor had to be met by crews of evangelists. Because the men came under such conviction sailing into New York Harbor. That they had to have somebody come and bring the boat in. Because the men were on their faces, 
weeping and begging God for salvation. That particular prayer revival is one of the events that ended up leading to the abolitionist movement that led to the American Civil War. Isn't it amazing how almost every major event in our country's history has come at the result of God's intervention in our country? The American Revolution, the American Civil War, the War of 1812, America, World War One, World War Two. Let's close in prayer. Father. Thank you. You are a good and gracious God. Not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. I know, and I've seen you do it more often than I care to talk about. See you intervene in ways that are just totally mind-blowing. My good and gracious God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that in the midst of our struggles and our hurt 